Hey, it's Cornell and welcome to part two of the interview with Peter Hudson from 5i Research and Canadian Money Saver Magazine. Now, before we dive into part two, just a quick reminder to check out the show notes over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash 20. So just the number 20, where you can get the free gift from Peter and his team, which is a free trial membership at 5i Research. And there you can get uh, not only see Peter's investment model portfolios, but also get your investment questions answered for free by Peter and his team. And of course, while you're there, don't forget to sign up for free to the Build Wealth Canada newsletter if you're not a member already, where you'll get exclusive content only available to Build Wealth Canada subscribers and another free gift as well. All right, so I'll see you there. And now let's get to part two of the interview with Peter. All right, Peter, welcome back to part two of the interview. Thank you. (laughs) So Peter, I'm sure you get asked a lot about whether we should be using our TFSAs or whether we should be using our RSP, you know, whether we're investing in indexes or the 5i portfolio. Can you give us your take on which vehicle you recommend, you know, under what circumstances would you recommend one or the other? Sure. I mean, the, the, the playing field changed a little bit this year with the government increasing the TFSA limit to 10,000. Yeah. So certainly we think if you, if you, the order of priority we think is first off, if you have any debt, uh, it's generally a good idea to pay that down. Now, the reason for that is it's a guaranteed return. If you're paying 5% interest, that's after-tax money. And if you're in a, say, 50% tax bracket, that's a 10% guaranteed return if you pay down debt. So assuming you've you've taken care of that or you've got a locked-in mortgage for a period of time, then certainly the TFSA, is uh, we think, is the first place to go, um, primarily for two reasons. One, it has the most flexibility of of any of the registered accounts. Um, you can take money out, you can put it back in, and of course, it never, ever gets taxed. With an RSP, a lot of people sort of forget this, that eventually they will tax your RSP. Mm-hmm. And um, if it's successful and you've got a lot of money coming out at the end of your uh, your working life- lifetime, it will be taxed at a pretty high rate. Um, and some people are of the view that you know, while there's tax-deferred gains, if you make a lot of money and your value of your, your fund increases fivefold, you're going to pay that much more in taxes. So we think the TFSA is the way to go, um, again, because of that flex- flexibility, but also because you don't actually need earned income to have a TFSA. Just You only have to be 18 years old, and then you can start com- uh, contributing. So there's no requirement to um, have a job, make money, um, and so we're encouraging a lot of parents to pre-fund their children's uh, TFSA if they put it in when they're 18, you know, 40 or 50 years later, they'll be doing pretty well as long as they don't make any mistakes. So that's where we would start first. Generally, um, while we're, we're big stock pickers and we believe in stock um, stock picking and stock out performance, ETFs, are, if you're just starting out, are, are certainly fine for, the, for a TFSA. They get you instant diversification. You get invested right away. Your money starts working for you right away. And the fees can generally be pretty low. Once you've built up a, a decent amount of money in a fund then, or in your account, then you can uh, go off into individual stocks. Okay, great. And then a common argument, uh, I would say, against the TFSA and for using the RSP instead is that if, you're, you know, if you crunch the numbers and if you plan that you will be making less once you're retired than you are right now, then the RSP is the better choice because you know if you're in a different uh, tax bracket. So what's kind of your, um, I would say, counter to that common argument? Sure. Actually, in Canadian Money Saver magazine, in the, the June issue of this year, in July, August issue of this year, we've got that, that sort of uh, point topic covered in uh, quite a lot of detail. And we go through some of the numbers and sort of mm-hmm. where, where you end up at the end of the day, depending on what your tax rates are. But I guess the, the biggest counter argument I've got for that is people should plan to be successful. To plan on not having that much money coming out at retirement, we think is counterintuitive. We want you to be as rich as possible coming out of retirement. So, gotcha. um, you know, with that, with that goal in mind, um, then certainly the TFSA looks better. Okay, gotcha. And then ideally, though, I assume you would say that we should be maxing them both out, if at all possible, right? If we're, let's say we're planning an early retirement. Yes, a- absolutely. I mean, certainly there, you know, we don't want to bash the RSP too much. But, um, you know, the, the contribution there, and, you know, if you do get a tax refund, that that sort of helps as long as you put it back into the RSP. And certainly mm-hmm. anything where you can defer taxes for as long as possible is is positive to your, your net financial well-being. well-being. Got it. Gotcha. And then what about using unregistered accounts or something that's not tax sheltered at all? Is there any scenario where we should consider using that instead when we still have TFSA or RRSP contribution room left over? 
Yeah, gen generally this this gets a little bit more complicated based on your individual personal situation. So mm -hmm. if you have um, uh, just dividend income, for example, the dividend tax credit can be very, very attractive for, for Canadians. And so if you only, if you had no other job and no other income and only had dividend stocks, you could earn about $58,000 tax-free in Ontario <laughs> with just dividends. And it's pretty hard to beat a tax rate of zero with total flexibility. <laughs> yeah. Even the other accounts can't really can't really do that. And so, you know, that's but that's basically you need you need a couple couple of million dollars or three or four million dollars to get to that uh, sort of income level for sure. And so it's really up to you know your individual situation. But certainly, if you have um, if you're investing in companies that don't pay dividends. Um, then a capital gain that's deferred, say you buy a stock at a dollar and 20 years later it's $30 and it doesn't pay dividends, you've paid zero tax on that for 30 years, much like you would with an RSP as well. And that actually might be better than an RSP because when you do pay tax, it's capital gains tax and it's not taxed as income like your RSP would be. So it really depends on your financial and tax situation and um, what you're investing in. But Certainly, um, certainly, there's an advantage to owning dividend stocks if you're in the right tax break, tax rate, and there's an advantage in owning capital gain stocks outside of a registered plan. Again, depending on your tax rate. Gotcha. So it sounds like it's something that you know, if you're really trying to decide, it's a conversation to have perhaps with your accountant to see, okay, let's look at all my sources of income, let's look at our expenses, and see strategically how should I be structuring this uh, to basically minimize my tax burden would that be a good suggestion yeah a absolutely so the the considerations are um either pay no tax ever uh and that's one option in a tfsa or defer taxes as long as possible and that's whether you're in an rsp or with capital gains or just reduce taxes and, and pay the lowest rate whenever you actually have to pay those taxes so those are the main considerations um, and much depends on your current income and much depends on what you expect your income to be in retirement as well. So there's lots of assumptions there and, mm. um, you know, there's no real perfect solution, but I think the, the key for Canadians anyway is to, you know, get some money working for you, um, worry about the taxes later. And I think a lot of people worry too much about taxes and to the detriment of their investment performance, they worry right. so much about taxes that they perhaps don't put up put aside enough money or they don't invest in the right types of type of companies and ends up costing them in the end. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a good point. I could see it getting a bit overwhelming where, okay, now I have to set up a meeting with my accountant. Do you have to look at all these things? I have to pay them all this money to do all this analysis. And in the meantime, you're not saving, you're not investing. So your suggestion is, look, get started. Your, your suggestion is do the TFSA, um, utilize that as much as possible. And then I guess once your portfolio starts growing a bit and, and you know, you're, you're maybe you're earning more income now as well, you know, then you start having those meetings with the accountant and then you start talking about optimization. That's exactly. Would that be fair? That's exactly. Okay. Fair. Awesome. And then you mentioned about sort of the whole uh, dividend strategy, right? And we hear about this from from different people in the personal finance space, right? And there are those who are just, they, they, they consider themselves dividend investors, right? And the whole idea of being able to live off your, your dividends uh, indefinitely. What, what are your thoughts about that particular strategy? Um, I mean, it's, it's we, we love it in terms of, uh, I've done some, uh, some courses for, for young people. And the way that I get them hooked is, I say, you know, you can invest, you can do a little bit of homework right now, and then you get paid for your entire life. And not only do you get right. paid for your entire life, every year, if you pick the right company, you get a, you get a raise. So mm -hmm. instead of working, you know, working for the man for 40 years, you can do a little bit of work on your own for, you know, a week or two, find a good company, and then that company will pay you and give you a raise every year for the rest of your life. You just really could sit on the couch and collect your dividends. So that really, really hooks the, the young people that I talk to. But certainly it's a it's a fabulous strategy. And um, not only does the government give you a tax advantage to that, um, the majority of companies will raise their dividends over time. And that's been proven to be the best investment uh, in the stock market is companies that raise their dividends. So certainly we would highly encourage dividend stocks over, over non-dividend stocks right now. There's many, many different reasons for dividend outperformance. One is is sort of um, just common sense. When a company has to pay their shareholders every three months, they don't go out and do silly things. They don't buy companies that aren't helpful to the business. They don't expand when they perhaps shouldn't. Um, so it instills a discipline on management teams for sure. And so we think dividends are one of the uh, the eight wonders of the world. Absolutely.
Gotcha. And so would you actually recommend someone doing that research and, and trying to go for these maybe value dividend uh, paying companies and, and buy them? Or are you, do you think ETFs, for example, and just buying the index? I mean, how do you sort of compare the two? Because they're, you know, you, you can you only have so much money to go around, right? Sure. Well, there's certain, there's a couple of dividend, um, there's quite a few actually uh, dividend focused ETFs. So in Canada, mm-hmm. there's uh, one with the symbol uh, CDZ, and that's a Canadian dividend aristocrat. ETFs. So it, oh, okay, yep. it will only include companies that have raised their dividend for every year of the past five. So certainly mm-hmm. you can sort of segment your um, your ETF allocation towards dividend paying companies. In the US, there's one called VIG, which is the same sort of thing. They only focus on companies that have raised their dividends. But of course, there are fees on these. And so if you have if you have enough money to own six or seven dividend companies that grow their dividends over time, you're still going to do better. Uh, mm-hmm. But certainly, I don't want to bash those ETFs too much because they're they're quite uh, they're quite good funds. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so somebody that's let's say you know they're starting off investing, maybe they're in their I don't know thirties, forties, maybe let's say. I mean, for for them, would you recommend sort of that dividend approach, or would you recommend let, let's say they're not going to do the stock picking uh, scenario, let's say. Um, so in those case, uh, like you know, for growth, right? So let's say they. Should they try to go with a dividend strategy or with just get the broad market indexes, let them let them grow? You know, obviously you get some dividends from those two, right? But it won't be as as much as if you're buying those, you know, specific companies direct. Is there one strategy that you prefer over the other? Yeah, absolutely. So the, um, the again, the companies that raise their dividends have. Uh, I wish I could sort of uh, on this technology show you this chart that uh, that's been produced a couple of times. Where um, the dividend out, a dividend, a company that grows its dividend, if you own those versus the market, or if you own those versus companies that pay high dividends that don't grow them, then mm-hmm. the yield performance, you know, I'll use my hands here, is just dramatic in terms of okay. uh, the long term performance. And so it's it's really quite stellar. In, Interesting. In the past, perhaps fifteen years in Canada, you you probably would have earned four or five percent more on a compound basis owning a dividend appreciation stock on average than a, than a TSX stock. It's just quite stunning. And of course, the TSX, if you're buying that index, there's plenty of companies there that um, are only in there because of their certain size. They may not be great companies, but they just have a big market cap. And there's right. plenty of companies in there that don't pay dividends at all. So if you try and concentrate your portfolio with companies that raise their dividends, like the, the CDZ or the VIG ETFs do, um, you should be far, far better off than uh, just buying the market. Okay, that's great. That's great. No, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I'll have to do some more research about it though, because yeah, I, I heard about the you know the aristocrat uh, companies that fit into that. And uh, but yeah, it's interesting that you've actually looked at the numbers yourself and and compared them to the general index. That's great. Um, and then I mean, there, if you buy them though, you're not as diversified. But I guess for you that would be you'd say that's a risk, I suppose, worth taking because there's still large companies are not as volatile, I assume? Yeah, I mean, uh, dividend dividend paying stocks do tend to be less volatile. You do have to keep an eye on the diversification because there's certain sectors, financial utilities and um, telecoms that tend to raise their dividends. And so this year has mm-hmm. been kind of interesting because some of those stocks over the past five months have, have taken quite a hit because interest rates, people are worried about interest rates going up. But I would still rather own a company that has the potential to raise their inter- their dividend than a company that does not. And um, so it does go in cycles. But if you if you look over a long enough time frame, including other cycles where interest rates have risen, um, mm-hmm. these companies have tend to outperform on a on a wide margin. Okay, that's great. And then regarding because I'm kind of talking about five I again. You guys have your growth portfolio. You have your income portfolio. Depending on which, if we choose to go with one of those, should that would that alter our decision whether we do RSP or TFSA, for example, or whether we should use an unregistered account maybe for the income portfolio because of the dividend, the preferential tax treatment on dividends? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, again, this this sort of goes back to your tax rate and your age. We we've, we've sort of recommend to our customers that um, they use our growth portfolio for the TFSA. Again, the mm-hmm. goal there is to maximize your your ultimate return on a tax free basis, and so these companies in our growth portfolio tend to be growing at a much faster rate. And if if they're successful, then ten years down the down the down the time frame, you'll have a nice portfolio that's completely tax free. The income fund actually um, that we have does own a couple of um, bond ETFs, and so there is it's not as good in terms of non registered accounts because those of course are taxed as in, as interest. 
right? right. It does have dividend stocks, which you get the dividend tax credit as well. And then our other portfolio, we call it the balanced equity portfolio. It it, it would be sort of a, a mix of solid dividend growing companies and solid companies that, that actually don't have dividends. And so that might be better for a non-registered account because you get both the capital gains potential and the dividend tax credit. There's no interest income in there at all. So we would say that goes into the non-registered, the TFSA is for our growth portfolio. And um, if you want to be conservative in your RSP, then the income portfolio would make sense. Okay. Okay. That's great. Um, and then now your portfolios, now, since we're talking about them now, they've done quite well as we talked about in part one of the interview. So I'm sure you get this question a lot. What if somebody wants to hop on board, would like to implement one of these portfolios for themselves, but they're concerned that they've missed the boat and that now they're buying these companies when they're, the prices are already at their peak, you know, especially you you know, I'm sure you've had some companies in there that have done exceptionally well. Right. So, you know, I'm sure there's that's probably a common sort of objection, right. As well. I don't know if I want to go with five I because they've had this great run so far. I don't want to be buying at the peak anymore. Um, but I know you, I, I kind of know what your answer is just because I've read your, your post and such, but I, I think for our listeners, it'd be good to hear your sort of your counter to that argument. Sure. I guess the, the biggest counter argument is um, they are dynamic portfolios. So we take them pretty seriously and we watch them every, every day, even though, you know, as an individual investor, you shouldn't be looking at things every day, but we look at it every day. Um, and we kick companies out if we, if we don't think the potential is there, we think that um, it's kind of run its course. And so they are dynamic. I guess the other. Oh, hey Peter, it just uh, it just disconnected for a sec. Okay, uh, all right, we're back. <laughs> okay, so it... um, first, they're dynamic portfolios, so they do change uh, fairly regularly. We like to keep the the best companies in there, but we do rotate the companies uh, in and out a little bit. But the other issue is we're trying to buy companies for the full cycle, and so we want to buy. We don't know when the next recession is going to happen or when the next market correction is going to happen. It could happen today. It could happen ten years from now. So we want to buy a company that we're quite happy owning it throughout the whole cycle. So if we buy good quality companies that are well managed and well financed and have lots of cash flow, sure, the stock will go up and down, but over a 10 year period, it should probably do pretty well. And the valuation question, you know, it does always come up and we always go back to uh, one of our favorite companies is called Constellation Software. When it was $20, people were saying it was expensive and they're saying, oh, it's gone from 10 to 20. I don't want to get in at 20. Well, today it's 500, and that's, <laughs> yeah. that's happened in about four or five years. And we still get the same question. It's like, oh, it's gone from 200 to 500. Is it expensive? Um, and this happens with all the, with all the good companies as well. Is basically, um, if you're a good company, you can continue to grow your earnings, continue to grow your cash flow, continue to grow your dividend. Your stock price does tend to go up over time. And um, you, you have to ask yourself, and what we do to try and help out people there is, there are people buying it at that price. You have to ask themselves, what did they see in the company? Um, do they view that it's still a good company with growth potential because they're paying up for that while you're considering to selling or not, not participating? You have to put yourself in the buyer's shoes. And it's a very good exercise because sometimes a stock at $10 is better than it was when it was at $2. If it's done the right things, made the right deals and grown their business, it could actually be less risky at 10 than it was at two. Um, and a lot of people have a big, big problem with that. And we try and sort of walk them through that. Maybe it's not a, not a bad problem to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was one of the things that really got me interested in five. I was because I don't really subscribe to the whole get rich quick sort of approach, right? Where, Oh, let's just find some, some penny stocks that are going to skyrocket. Let's try to find those or, you know, let's try to just get these really volatile stocks and, and just kind of hope for the home run right away. Uh, w with 5i, what I noticed just by reading your, your different posts and, and, and just by seeing the different things you've put out there that you guys really focus on selecting good companies that are you know sustainable for the long run and are you know they have the solid fundamentals right that like you said they can go they can weather the storm you know when there's a downturn they can do you know they can do quite well like I, I know you mentioned that a lot right how you n nowadays you you look very favorably on companies that don't have a lot of debt because they're more likely to do better if there is a it, they're able to survive and weather the storm if there is a downturn so yeah I think that was a really good um, that really spoke to me personally um, is, is kind of how you're searching for good companies not just sort of these get rich quick, you know, let's find these these penny stocks, right, and go for the home run, or we might lose everything in one swoop, right? So you don't really subscribe, it seems, to that approach. No, not at all. We've, we've seen so many investors sort of destroy their portfolios by trying to get rich quick. Um, mm -hmm. They sort of fall into, you know, the promoters and the resource companies and the, 
you know, the high tech companies that have a new doodah that doesn't quite work as well as expected or the, the yeah. companies that are trying to cure cancer. And of course, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And so, you know, slow and steady is by far preferable. Um, it's less stressful. It's less risky. Um, it's better for you. It's better for your portfolio. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking a chance on something, but it's not investing. It's gambling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure. And then, Peter, I want to ask you about asset allocation between stocks and bonds as well. Now, bonds kind of have been a hotly debated topic, right? Because you know, right now, that you know, the interest on them is pretty low. Do you still recommend bonds? You know, what and what are your thoughts about the allocation between stocks versus bonds? Yeah, I mean, we're stock people at Five Eye primarily, but in terms of asset allocation, um, bonds serve a purpose. They serve a purpose in maintaining their value in, in a really, really rough environment. They continue to provide income, and it's secured income, and they add some stability to your portfolio. What's happening right now is because bonds have become more volatile, people are kind of forgetting all the benefits of bonds. Uh, people are worried about interest rates, and bonds are declining. But you have to look at, again, at a longer, a longer time horizon. When the market is bad, bonds start looking pretty good. When you have a 4 or 5% bond coupon coming in, regardless of what the market's doing, that can be quite attractive, and it can help your portfolio. So... We we don't think anyone should go zero bond zero percent bonds just like we don't think anyone should go one hundred percent stocks. Um, much depends on your personal situation, but it's a very very solid asset class. Um, we would prefer individual bonds over ETFs because ETFs do fluctuate in value much more um, mm -hmm. because there is a supply and demand issue, and you also have a manager who's act actively trading those ETF bonds. But if you own a Government of Canada bond and you own it to maturity. You have no risk of principal if you hold it to maturity. If you sell it in right. the in the interim, you know it could go up or down. But if you hold it to principal, you're going to get all your money back. Now there may be inflation and there may be lack of purchasing power and all those things, but you're going to get your money back. And that can't be said for the stocks where you just have no idea what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So even for somebody that's let's say a really aggressive investor, they have a high risk tolerance, but they just you know they feel very confident that if there is a downturn, they could just still you know hold let's say the etfs that they're holding um let's say you know they're investing in broad market indexes um would you st still not recommend a full equity portfolio for that individual person yeah and this is where we we sort of have to get off the generalization path i mean if, if you're a young investor with a 20 or 30 year time frame and you've got mm -hmm. more more money coming in than going out then sure we we could go uh you know 100 percent bonds or sorry 100 percent stocks Right. Because you can have the ability to buy more when things are down, um, but generally, you know, we on an average basis, the, you know, if you're a 40 or 50 year old investor that's trying to set up a retirement scenario, right. you don't want to be in a situation where you're loading up on stocks five years ahead of retirement. And so, certainly, exactly. your age and your income come into play, um, and your risk tolerance as well. If if you are 100 percent convinced that you're not going to panic and sell your stocks when the next financial crisis comes by. You know, sure, you can you can have a much higher equity allocation, uh, mm -hmm. but I guess my earlier question is: there's nothing wrong with uh, or my earlier answer. There's nothing wrong with bonds, whereas mm -hmm. right now they're kind of viewed as um, you know nobody wants to touch them right now because they haven't done so well recently. Right. Okay. That sounds good. No, thanks. Yeah. I know we kind of, because the general thing is, you know, the, there's all these different formulas, right, about taking into account your age and things like that. Um, but then, yeah, but then there's sort of those those outliers too, right? Like you said, there's someone that's very young. Maybe they have a very positive cash flow every month from their, their income uh, that they earn and they want to take that risk. You know, is, is that worth it? So no, so I'm, I'm glad that you uh, you addressed that for sure. Um, now, one other question I had is um, kind of going back to 5i, you assign a letter grade to the stocks in your portfolio as well. So is that more if we aren't following your portfolio and are just picking and choosing stocks from the list that you've analyzed or not? Yeah, absolutely. So we're we're trying to rate the quality of the company, and um, we wanted to use a high school letter grade system just because it's much easier to understand. Everybody gets it. If you're on Bay Street and you're looking at a stock report from a Bay Street analyst, you know he might say he or she might say underperform or sector weight or overweight. And nobody, you know, I was in the business for 30 years. I still don't know what those mean. And there's sort of these generic terms that don't really mean anything. So with our system, an A company is better than a C company. Everybody can figure that out. Um, and if you want to create your own portfolio, you know, we would suggest trying to high grade it with a bunch of A stocks and, a, you know, a bunch of B stocks and maybe a couple of C stocks 
And then you mm-hmm. can pick and choose your portfolio based on your own personal preferences and where you think sectors are going to go and things like that. So we do the portfolios really um, just to make it easy for people, but we have about 80 stocks under coverage right now. And so, um, you know, you can do it on your own as well. Awesome. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, and then uh, last question is, for the ETF portion of the portfolio, um, or even if we choose not to do the stock picking where we want to stick with ETFs, let's say, I know in uh, Money Saver magazine that you that you own, you guys suggest a bunch of different ETFs as well. Yes. Um, and I noticed, you know, some people take the approach of, okay, just buy these four, let's say, ETFs, right? And you've got everything covered. You've got, you know, everything's diversified nicely. You've covered all the sectors, right? I, I noticed in Money Saver, you guys go into a bit more, uh, detail about you know, individual ETFs. Um, and so that kind of brings me to my question of that there's these more targeted ETFs like small cap ETFs, let's say, as opposed to just buying the, the entire broad market you know, index. So, you know, when we're, what are your thoughts about going with one, you know, going sort of into these specific ETFs as opposed to the broad ones? I mean, the, the targeted ones do tend to have higher fees. So now those should need to be offset, right, by the higher returns. So, you know, what are your, how do you kind of decide which way to go? Do you go for that simplicity portfolio or do you try to optimize it by buying some of these targeted uh, ETFs? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because um, if you buy a, a regular market ETF, you're going to get the market return, which over a long period of time is pretty pretty good, and you're going to beat a lot of the, the mutual funds because of that. Um, the targeted retur- targeted funds are really if you want to tilt your portfolio. So if you're a, um, a young investor and you want more aggressive uh, ETFs, then you can add small caps or you could add technology ETFs or you could add um, uh, biotech ETFs to become more aggressive. And so there, there is a value to them. Um, it does require a little bit of um, trying to predict what's going to happen, though. Um, you've got a situation where if you think that technology is going to be a great sector, then buying a market ETF is not going to get you enough technology exposure. So you might want to overlay that with a technology ETF. If you're wrong, of course, um, you know that ETF is going to hurt you, both from a performance point of view and the higher fees, as you mentioned. So um, it really, again, it, it's the ETF sector ETFs and the specialized ETFs are really to help you set up your own personalized uh, portfolio without using stocks. And so you can say, I want to go this area and that area. I don't want any banks because I think the financial system is you know, going to collapse like Greece. And you can go 0% banks by having other ETFs in different sectors. Mm. And so it becomes more of a, a dynamic process and you have to do more work on it and you have to do more predicting on it, which we never really like to have investors do because right. the predictive ability of investors has been proven to be really, really bad. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. um, you can tilt your portfolio depending on where you are at your stage of life. Gotcha. Okay, that's a great answer. Thanks. Yeah. So you're just, if you do that option, you're basically going away from the whole passive portfolio you know, ETF approach that kind of is, is what's attractive to a lot of people, right? Yes. Um, you're now going in, you're now getting into these predictions. You're now taking on more risk as well, more, more time investment as well to study and all this. So, um, you know, that, that's really interesting. So it's, it's almost like a completely different investing strategy. It's like, I don't want to invest in stocks per se directly, but I still want to sp- maybe almost like speculate a little bit just with ETFs instead of stocks. It that's, ex- like. that's exactly right. And at certain yeah. there, sectors do move in cycles, though. When you get um, an inflationary period, um, the metals and the, um, the precious metals and the base metals tend to run quite a lot. So if you're of the view that inflation is going to start kicking in, you might want to have some of those ETFs in your portfolio. But again, it's much more active. You've got to pay much more attention and you have to, you have to be able to sell at the right time and shift into something else because when, uh, when deflation kicks in, those things aren't going to do very well. Right. Okay. No, that's great. That's great. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, th- that's all really that I had for, for my questions. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. And where can we learn more from you and you know, both with 5i and with the Money Saver and anything else you might have going sure, on? Sure. Our uh, website at 5i is 5iresearch.ca and Money Saver is CanadianMoneySaver.ca. Um, we actually on 5i, we have an education, um, a free educational uh, page where we'll list sort of, um, I think there's seven or eight articles, in-depth articles about sort of some of the basics that you need to look at in investing. And then now on our blog page, which is also free, I think we have 300 now blogs uh, discussing all sorts of different topics about um, whether it's dividend investing or ETF investing or high fees on mutual funds. There's lots of good information on there that, that we just give out to anybody who wants it because 
we just want people to be better informed. If they're our customers, that's fine. But if they're better informed, then then they're going to be in okay shape as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's great, Peter. Thank you so much. And for sure, I'll put all those links in the in the show notes as all well. Right. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so so that's all that I have uh, on my end. So yeah, thanks again for coming. Uh, I learned a lot. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the listeners did as well. And uh, no, it's it's great to have you on the show. And I, I look forward to being a, a Money Saver subscriber for a long, long time. <laughs> I already am. And I <laughs> I just renewed my subscription the other day, right. actually. <laughs> those, that, those are the best types of customers. <laughs> right. Thanks so much. All right. Thank, all right. Thanks okay, a lot, bye-bye. Peter. Bye. All right. I hope you enjoyed part two of the interview with Peter. Remember to go to buildwealthcanada.ca slash 20 for your free gift from 5 Eye Research where you can get the free trial and get more of your investment questions answered by Peter and his team. Also, while you're there, don't forget to sign up to the Build Wealth Canada newsletter to get another free gift from me and be informed when I have new giveaways for you and exclusive content only available to Build Wealth Canada subscribers. All right, thanks for listening and see you over at buildwealthcanada.ca to let me know what you thought of this episode. All right, have a great week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Build Wealth Canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca. 